Welcome everyone to session two of the webinar series, RFID for Local Governments, sponsored by Impinge and HANA Technologies. I'm Martha Mallon, Senior Director of Global Partner Marketing for Impinge. And together with HANA, we are excited to give you this great lineup of Impinge partners each month to help you build your understanding of RFID technology and how it can improve the efficiency of government operations. Today's featured partner is Atlas RFID Store. Atlas RFID Store is headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama, and is a trusted source in the IoT industry. As a global retailer, Atlas RFID Store has served more than 30,000 customers around the world by providing customers a secure one-stop shop where you can purchase IoT components and solutions for your own systems and applications. Now, before I introduce our speakers, we'd like to start with a quick poll. This poll is gonna help our panelists understand a little bit more about our audience today. And we'd like to know if you were uh, about your, how your organizations track assets. Let us know if you are not tracking at all, um, what uh, you are using uh, some Excel or some non-automated tracking technology. You track using barcode today, you're tracking using other automated technology, or you're tracking using RFID. A couple of little demographic questions as well, and we'll share the results of that poll a little bit later. I'd also like to point out two quick features of the Zoom events that you should take advantage of today. The first is the Q&A panel. All audience members are muted, but you can ask the questions and of the speakers and panelists as we go, and we'll do our best to incorporate them in the Q&A session at the end or answer them as we go along in the chat stream. The second feature is the resources folder that you can find at the bottom of your screen. This folder contains helpful RFID resources from the series sponsors, and you can download them. So be sure to check that out. So let's introduce uh, today's speakers and panelists. Today's pr presenters will be Suzanne Gottfried. She's the Director of Consumer Marketing and Stephen Wood, Director of Sales from Atlas RFID Store. Then joining Suzanne and Stephen in a panel discussion and Q&A at the end of the session, we'll have Paul Brown, Vice President of Sales from HANA Technologies, and Joe Gamillion, Senior Director, Sales Director at Impinge for Endpoint ICs. All right, so before I go hand it over to Zan, let's take a quick uh, uh, look at the results of that poll. All right. All right. It looks right. like we have 57% uh, are from local government and uh, spattering from industry and other. Um, obviously, the majority of the people seem to be from the United States, 88%. And it looks like an awful lot of the people are working in GIS management and IT management, which is kind of interesting. Um, generally speaking, we seem to have a split between people under 25,000 size of cities and over 100,000 100, size of cities. Great. Thank you very much. All right, Suzanne and Stephen, uh, thank you for being here today. And I'm going to hand things over to Suzanne. All right. Thank you so much, Martha. Really love being here and hope everybody um, loves the webinar and gets a lot of really good insight from it. So we're going to talk about RFID basics for local government. Um, so again, I just want to say, look for a few fun polls to throughout to gauge your understanding of RFID. Um, and kind of like Martha said, there's going to be material available now and afterwards. Um, and here are the three things that are available as well as the agenda for the day. All right, so RFID basics. So we're gonna start off with our most basic definition here. What is RFID? As you might already know, technology has maybe just as many acronyms as the government. Maybe, we'll see. But RFID is an acronym for radio frequency identification, which just means that it communicates as wireless non-contact radio waves that transfer data. Now, I know that you, you might be thinking, okay, the data is transferred by these in invisible radio waves. You may be wondering, is that a new thing? So the answer is no. As you can see on the slide, here are other communication technologies that use RF waves to transfer data and enable some of the tech items that we use every single day, like cell phones, radios, and TV. So radio waves are just one type of, of invisible wave that we use in our everyday life. Radio waves are on the left side of the electromagnetic spectrum, which means they're slower waves, and the speed and the intensity ramps up the more you move toward the right to gamma rays. 
RFID falls in the radio waves category between TV and microwave, just in terms of the speed of the waves and the frequency that they emit at. Now let's look at the different types of radio waves and which ones are approved for RFID use. The main three that are used in RFID applications are low frequency, high frequency, and ultra high frequency. So we're gonna talk a little bit about these three orange highlighted frequencies, and then we'll go strictly toward UHF RFID. But first we'll start at LF. So LF RFID is low frequency RFID. It's a very short read range of only about three to four inches at the most. Even though there are a lot of LF RFID tags around, there are not many feasible applications for that. The most notable are chips for animal identification and hotel keys and building access fobs. And now we have our first poll on screen uh, talking about pet chipping. So have you ever had your pets chipped and did you know it was RFID technology? I'll give you all a minute to um, answer that one. Okay, and we're gonna look at the poll results um, a little bit further later in the presentation. So we'll move on to our next one. So because you have to position the reader so close to the tag, as you can see in this image, LF is only used for applications that need to read one tag at a time. So next we're moving on to high frequency. So high frequency RFID or HF has a longer read range than LF, but a little shorter than UHF, which we'll get to next. So an HF RFID tag can be read from around 12 inches away. Honestly, HF RFID is seen kind of the most around you in the form of NFC technology. A lot of people get the two confused. So HF RFID is a range of frequencies and NFC is just one band on that range. So it's sort of like saying you're watching TV versus you're watching Food Network. So TV, like HF, contains a range of channels and NFC is just one particular channel that was standardized. You'll most likely see HF or NFC in access control, ticketing, payments, digital business cards, product authentication, loyalty cards, and even some marketing like digital menus when you're at a restaurant. So HF and NFC are great, but because of this very short read range, as you can see from the image, they're not really efficient for saving time in business, which is where UHF RFID comes into play. UHF RFID is the main point of the webinar today, and it's what you learned about in the previous section from RFID for you. UHF RFID has a long read range of between 10 and 30 feet on average, and it can be longer or shorter depending on your selected equipment. UHF RFID refers to the frequency range, but it's also called passive or rain RFID as well, and it's mainly used to identify assets and items and learn more about their movement and the environment. So some examples include race timing. If you ever run a marathon, you'll probably have an RFID tag on your bib. Uh, toll passes, retail inventory management, IT asset management, vehicle access management, car wash loyalty memberships, and food expiration dates and inventory. So here's an example of reading UHF tag boxes with a handheld UHF RFID reader. So one of the most notable things about this technology is, as you can notice, not all the bo boxes you can see the tags. Some tags are facing down, some are up, and some are to the side, but we can accurately read all 15 of them. I know that on screen in the video, you saw around 24. That's just because I had some other tags in the room when I took this quick, quick inventory, but you could easily filter those out if they're a problem and you have more tags in the area. All right, so I just wanna take a quick moment for a slide to show really why we're focusing on UHF RFID besides the long read range. So the main reasons, 20 feet in distance, that's pretty great. Um, so also you can have on average read about 750 tags per second. Depending on what we tag, we can customize the information based on reading one tag for a pallet or reading 24 tags, all of the items on the pallet. So UHF RFID is also the fastest growing technology and the cost is being driven down daily. So in the past 10 years, tags have gone from being 25 cents to $3 each to now at a low, at a high volume, you can actually get them for five cents each, which is amazing. So it's important for governments to be thinking about RFID because of all the federal mandates that are going around right now and have gone around in the past, which we're gonna talk about later in the webinar. Leads us to our second poll though. So are you aware of the federal mandates involving RFID from agencies like the Department of Defense and the Department of Agriculture? And there are many more. I'll give you a minute to, uh, to answer the poll. All 
All right. So, and again, we'll check out those answers here in a little bit. So now we're going to talk about the advantages of RFID. Um, now that we talked about advantages of UHF versus LF and HF, we're going to talk about UHF versus other item tracking technologies. So first, we're going to talk about one you probably know the most about, barcodes. So barcodes need line of sight, and they can only be read, read from a couple of feet away. So most people in the industry, especially our industry, talk about line of sight. Uh, but what is it? So line of sight is just saying that you need to see the face of something in order to read it. So like these barcodes are showing here, you have to actually see the barcode to read it. So in this next video, I'm going to show you how you can read an RFID tag with line of sight and without line of sight, which is an awesome feature. Um, so in this first part of the video, I will read the tag with line of sight, I obviously can see the tag. And then I'm gonna flip the box over. Um, and then I will still be able to read that tag perfectly, which is something you cannot have with barcodes. All right, next up, we're actually gonna talk about the main item tracking technologies. So here are the ones that we have identified as kind of the main asset tracking technologies. So the brief text under them, I call out the cons or the problems with each one of those. And I know usually people say, oh, show me the pros and the cons but it's really easy to call out the positives. So they all can track items, obviously. And also as you move from left to right, they can track items at a longer distance. So in the front, you have barcodes, which is just a few feet, all the way to geolocation, we can track you all over the world, right? So what I wanna do is kind of focus on the problem so we can look at why UHF is the least problematic. <laughs> so, Let's look at these. So with barcodes, it's extremely inefficient to scan one barcode at a time from a couple of feet away. With RFID, metal and water interference can be an issue, but it can be mitigated with the right equipment. And some say there is a slightly higher cost of setup than barcodes as well, but it doesn't really compare to the next two that we're about to talk about. So active RFID is expensive. Um, it's expensive to set up and it's expensive to maintain because the tags die between three and five years due to battery life. So that would mean every three to five years, you're stuck buying all new tags, uh, which can be expensive, like $20 each. Um, so geolocation, you're probably going to be pretty familiar with. So it's kind of like your Apple tags, um, which are, you know, cost, they're not that bad. You're probably thinking Apple tag is only $25, but that would be $25 per asset in your office, which is pretty costly for just a setup, not to mention the recurring fees from the service that you're going to pay, which could be around $200 a year. So that would be extremely expensive to get going with. All right. So in this video, I just want to show you a quick side-by-side -side comparison about reading RFID tags versus reading barcodes. I honestly re leave the reader out for a minute. As you can see, the first like second, it takes all the boxes and sees them, but I just needed to have that on screen as well. Um, so it already read all 15 boxes, but as you can see, it's such a less manual process. Um, all right. So we have a poll question coming up as well. Um, so how often do you scan barcodes at your work? Um, some people do it every single day, a few times a week few times a month, during inventory counts throughout the year, or never, which would be nice, but I don't know if you'd be interested in asset tracking. All right, I am going to move on. We'll check out those results in a few minutes as well. So now we talked a lot about UHF RFID, and I've showed you some examples of reading tags. Now we'll go through like what's actually in a system. So I know this slide looks like there's a lot going on, but this simple GIF or GIF, however you want to say it, um, it shows you how power moves through a system. So basically power comes in through the RFID reader's power source, which could be an AC adapter cable or through an ethernet cable as well. It comes into the reader and then it goes through the RFID cable to the RFID antenna. And what happens then is the RFID antenna converts that energy into RF waves, which then are sent out into free space looking for RFID tags. And once the RFID tags get hit with the energy, they use some of that energy to push the energy back toward the RFID reader with their information on it. I don't want to go in too deep of a dive in this because I know you guys are just beginners, but I really wanted to show you kind of like what's actually going on inside of a system so that you're aware of how it's being used and, and what it's doing. So now we'll go into our system components. 
So similar to a system in that graphic, the most common type of RFID system is a fixed system. Um, and that's because you can simply fix it and forget it in a way. So that isn't the only type though. Um, so there's also, like you can see in the videos, a handheld system. And so a handheld reader, it's really nice. It combines a reader, a cable, and an antenna into one device. And in those systems, you really just need a handheld reader and an RFID tag. Now, most of you are probably thinking, wow, less equipment, the better. I probably just want a handheld reader. But I want to show you the difference. So you can check out the individual pros and cons on this slide. And it's not all of the pros and cons, but probably the most important ones. So, but what I really want to talk about is one of these requires a human and one of them does not. So for a fixed reader on the right, you can set it up in a doorway or a room and on its own, it'll just sit there and take inventory for you, however often you'd like. So that's an awesome feature, right? So whereas a handheld reader must be used by a person to go into a room in an area or take inventory. So you're probably wondering, okay, now I just am thinking I want a fixed reader, but it really just depends on your setup and kind of where your assets are. So for instance, if your assets are spread out and not very mobile, you probably want to use a handheld RFID reader so you can go room to room every certain amount of times and just scan inside the rooms. However, if your assets are all in one area and they maybe they move frequently, you might want to set up an RFID fixed reader that can scan assets as they leave a room and timestamp that date and time that the asset actually left. So, I know RFID can be complicated, I get it, um, but I want to show you guys it doesn't really have to be. So in this short video, I'll take an RFID handheld reader, go ahead and start the video for you, take an RFID handheld, uh, handheld reader out of the box from a manufacturer and actually put it together. First, I got to put the battery in, get it to work, um, which these guys have a lot of spare batteries too, so you don't have to have any downtime between, they can always charge. Um, put the reader back together. And then, um, so you'll notice that some handheld readers will have like a screen, a mobile computer function. This one doesn't. Um, this one actually connects via Bluetooth to a phone or a tablet or a mobile computer. So all I did was just got a free app download and I just scanned the tags. I connected via Bluetooth, um, scan the tags and now make sure they work. And now I'm going to go ahead and tag all these boxes. Um, so information can be put on these tags. I think for these tags, I just did, I did barcode, I did box number, and then I encoded them with a specific number. So as you can see, I, again, I read a little bit more boxes than what we needed. I had extra boxes, um, but yeah, that's how kind of quick and, and easy it can be. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about RFID software since we've covered the hardware feature. So software is what makes your data meaningful. Um, so like you saw in the last video, I used a free app, but we just received the tag reads. We just received the numbers. Ideally, people want to know, okay, how many of each item do I have? Like, show me information, right? So our next slides, we're going to see what that looks like. Um, and I will say a lot of government agencies do have a software developer on staff that can make something unique for them, especially with some security and privacy concerns that they typically deal with. So um, this is Advancer, um, a software product that we partner with. And as you can see here, they're tracking firearms for Browning. So instead of a long number that you see, like you saw in the app, there was like a long number of the ID. So instead, you actually see each um, device's name, status, location, serial number, and other information. You can actually see exactly like visibly, okay, one's lost, one's consumed, one's incorrect, which is really awesome to just get a visual picture of. So on the next slide, you can see too that there are dashboards that you can create, which can be super meaningful to people just at a quick glance to say, okay, well, we have this many containers, we have this many of these containers, we have you know, these, this many that are lost, this many that are defected, you can just get an easy picture. So I want to say next up, we have our RFID use cases section. I kind of walked you through the basics. Um, and I wanna stop for a minute and show you all those answers to the polls. Um, if that is possible. Okay, so um, the first one is, do you have your pets, chips? And did you know it's RFID technology? Most of you do, and you do know it's RFID technology, which is awesome. But those of you who don't, it's okay. I don't think I really knew until I worked in this industry, so it's not a big deal. <laughs> All right, what about our next one?
but we can also come back to those if we need to. Um, oh, here's our federal, oh, yes, here's our federal mandate question. So are you aware of the federal mandates involving RFID from agencies like Department of Defense and Department of Ag? So some of you have read it and understand them. Some of you have heard a little and some of you haven't heard any at all, which is okay because government's pretty, can be pretty private at some point. So you're gonna have to look for the information. Um, and then our last one is barcodes. How often do you scan a barcode at work? Wow, I'm jealous. 56% said never, that's awesome. Um, but I know a lot of you probably do have inventory counts or other people that do scan barcodes for inventory counts. So I'm glad to hear you never have to, that's awesome. So um, next up, I'm gonna introduce Stephen Wood. He is our director of sales and he's gonna take over and talk about how RFID is used around the world and in government. He kind of sees it on a daily basis. So he is the best person to show us around. Well, thanks a lot, Suze. I really appreciate that overview on the basics of RFID. And, you know, like you said, my objective today is just to, uh, you know, share some common use cases for UHF RAIN RFID specifically. Uh, so it becomes more relatable and maybe give give our participants and, and attendees some ideas of how they can use it for their for their organizations. So, you know, to kick things off, I'd like to talk about one that's probably, you know, the most prevalent, most recognizable one that, that you'd be able to see today. And that's in in retail. So, you know, most most larger retailers these days, um, you know, Walmart's, Targets, Costco's, others are really leaning into RAIN RFID uh, to enhance their ability to see what they actually have on hand and what they don't have on hand. Uh, you know, my background's actually in retail and I spent, I spent year, six years working at the store level. And, and while I was a team member of the company, implemented RFID. And, and this really allowed us to, you know, take inventory audits as often as we needed to, sometimes even on a daily basis. So instead of, you know, taking inventory uh, one time a year, having a, a large crew come in and take inventory for us, we were able to put an RFID reader in the hands of one of our associates and take inventory on a daily basis, which, you know, as you can imagine, that could have a significant impact on the customer experience. I know that when I see something is on, on stock in stock online, my expectation is that I'll be able to go to the store and pick that up. And an RFID is just having a tremendous impact on how, uh, you know, making that that uh, in stock status true, right? Um, but you could also imagine how it's helping retailers do sales. I mean, they're putting product on the shelf and uh, product is available for for purchase. Um, you know, the next application and probably more relatable for most government organizations is asset tracking. So, you know, here are a few organizations that use UHF RAIN RFID at an enterprise level across the organization uh, for asset tracking. One of my favorite examples is, is Boeing here. So Boeing tags their, their tools. They're, they're, they're you know, used for aircraft maintenance, right? To, uh, and then they use the technology to confirm you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the shift, that all those tools are returned to that, that toolbox. Um, you know, as you can see, uh, you know, it's, Pretty critical safety feature. The last thing that any one of us wants is a is a wrench left inside an engine cowling. Um, so just a really great use case that saved them, you know, obviously a lot of money because they're not having to reorder tools. They have better visibility, but also has a tremendous impact on the safety of of uh, you know air travel. Um, another really relatable application is is how Disney has really expanded their use of RFID over the past decade. Um, you know, it started out as like their, their magic bands uh, for resort and, uh, you know, park access control. And it's, it's expanded into leveraging RFID for personalizing experiences across the park. Like when you ride a ride and they call you out by name, that's using RFID technology. Um, you know, but it's also being used behind the scenes. UHF RAIN RFID is specifically being used for costume uh, management for their character staff. It ensures that those those assets are where they need to be at the end of a shift, so the next shift can can pick it up and 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 go, uh, making things much much more efficient. And they continue to look for uh, new use cases for the technology. Uh, as Suzanne mentioned a few moments ago. 
you know, the federal government is, is really beginning to see the uh, advantages of this technology and it is emerging at the state and federal, or state and local level as well. Uh, but just to touch on a couple of applications where we're seeing it at the federal level is DOD. And, and DOD is really kind of a pioneer in this space. They've been using UHF RAIN RFID really since the beginning. Uh, and you know how they're using it is to enhance the visibility of their supply chain. Um, you know, they have their suppliers tag uh, you know whatever they're shipping to the to the DoD with an RFID tag, so the staff knows and can confirm that shipment quickly, knows who it came from, knows what order that it's associated with, and then once those things move into their possession, they're using those RFID tags to manage those assets from there. Most recently, you may have seen that the USDA has mandated that all livestock, stock, and cattle are going to be required to have a unique digital ID. And you know, the primary intent with this initiative is to be able to quickly identify you know, potential sources of, of diseases or, or other risks within the food supply chain to you know, cut it off at the pass before it proliferates. Um, you know, essentially, the objective is to have better visibility and, and track from farm to plate in as many instances as possible. So, you know, the next, the next couple of slides, we'll talk about some scenarios that Atlas, our team, has worked really closely with agencies and organizations to, to deploy. Uh, and here are some of our, our most popular ones, obviously asset tracking, IT asset tracking specifically, which is, you know, really important. A lot of sensitive information is, is, is uh, stored on, on IT assets, so we need to have visibility and know where those things are. Uh, inventory tracking, we're seeing um, this be a really big deal for documents and evidence, especially. Um, um, you know, library and book media management has been something that's been, uh, you know, happening for quite some time, but it continues to grow. Um, and then access control. So the next few slides, we'll talk about some specific, some specific use cases. Yeah, and before we get there, thank you so much, Stephen. I yeah. wanted to throw out a couple more polls. So my first poll question is, have you been to Disney World, Disneyland, or a Disney Cruise and used RFID technology while you were there? Because they're using it all over. So I'll give you all a couple minutes for that one. And our follow-up question, I guess that's only one minute, but our follow-up question is, have you purchased any retail items and seen an RFID tag on the price tag? All right, well, I'm gonna turn it back over to Stephen to go more in depth on a few use cases. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Liz. So, yeah, I mean, the first, um, you know, case study I'd like to cover is asset tracking uh, that we, we partner closely with the Drug Enforcement Administration to, to, you know, help them leverage RFID for managing those assets. And they're managing assets, uh, you know, really anything from a, you know, a basic piece of office furniture to more critical IT assets. Um, so this is allowing their team to accurately estimate the value of assets, you know, when it was purchased and, and, and depreciate those assets appropriately, but also give their team a bird's eye view of what assets the agency actually owns, which allows for a more streamlined transfer of assets from office to office because, you know, they have that visibility uh, and, uh, you know, avoid an unnecessary ordering situation and, you know, effectively saving taxpayer dollars. Um, the next application is with Oak Ridge National Laboratory. <clears throat> you know, as you can imagine, this laboratory, since its origin, has been responsible for handling extremely sensitive, dangerous chemicals and elements. And, you know, RFID, we worked with them to install RFID at various workstations and put uh, handheld readers in, in, their, in their team's hand, which has allowed for, you know, clear a, a clear breadcrumb trail or train of custody, a chain of custody on, on who has that who has that particular item and ensure it's going through the proper processes in the proper order. Um, and then the last uh, use case that I'd like to touch on today is evidence management. So, you know, we've worked with various police, police and sheriff's department across the nation to to leverage RFID to enhance their inventory evidence or there's ev in, the enhance their tracking of inventory of evidence. Um, you know, in the, the storerooms of uh, evidence, they 
that vary in size, um, but in most cases, we've seen that inventory audits have been happening on a, on a biannual basis too, and, and in some cases quarterly, where we're going in, they're going in and taking that, that audit manually, uh, either with, with, with barcode or just, just manually ensuring everything is there with just a written ID. Uh, but those customers that have leveraged RFID are now able to do that inventory audit as often as they'd like to, and it takes a very short time frame. One particular customer, they took inventory twice a year, and it would take them 48 hours to do just the inventory count. Well, now they're able to do that in 20 minutes, um, and you know they're doing it as often as they would like to, in some cases, once per day. So, you know, we primarily discussed RFID for, you know, asset and inventory tracking, but it, it is capable of, of so much more. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, having an open mind as it relates to this technology, it's really, you know, it's one of the best aspects of, of my job is getting to, to learn about the new ways that people would like to leverage the technology to give them visible uh, gives them visibility and give a digital record to everyday items, as well as those that are that are mission critical. So, you know, it enables you know visibility not just for a single facility. Like I mentioned earlier, you you tag your items across your organization. It gives you visibility, you know, to to see what you have, uh, you know, across across your organization, um, which has a significant impact on the reduction of cost. I mean, due to that better visibility. And you also be able to, you know, more accurately uh, log maintenance records, um, you know, preventative maintenance records when you purchase that item uh, and accurately depreciate that item over time um, is where we're really seeing a lot of the, the biggest features of using RFID for, for asset management. One thing in particular I'd like to touch on, it's really a big time-saving aspect and feature of using UHF RFID is pinpointing lost assets. So you may have heard of a tool called a Geiger counter, right, which measures the intensity of radiation. In a very similar fashion, it's possible to use UHF RAIN RFID technology to pinpoint a specific item. This video demonstrates this feature. Uh, as you've seen, we selected a specific item on the scanner, and the scanner is providing visible as well as audible indication as we move closer and further away from that item, allowing you to you know, pinpoint that item in particular, sort of like the hot cold game we used to play when we were, we were kids. So it's a great way to really cut down the time that your team or you may be spending on locating a specific asset. It really helps confirm, and this is what I'm looking for, helps you confirm that you found that, that item. Um, and the last thing I'd like to cover is our GSA contracts. So recently, uh, Atlas RFID store was awarded a contract, and I know that you know this is prevalently used at the federal level, but uh, you know state and, and local governments uh, piggyback on are able to piggyback on this. And you know we want to make sure we're making the technology as available as we can and being good ambassadors of UHF RAIN RFID technology and you know making this available to the government sector. So you know if you have any questions at all about this, you can scan that that QR code, reach out, reach out to our team directly. We have a government team that's ready to support you if you have any questions at all. Um, and I think that that pretty well sums up sums it up. Well, I think we're moving on to the Q&A section session now. Yeah, before we get there, I'd love to show some of those poll results. So for the Disney question, so yes, you've used RFID at Disney. It seems to be kind of the highest present, but second highest is never been to Disney, but I did know they, they use RFID. They're a little hush-hush about it, but a lot of people know about their magic band technology. So let's go to the next question. So have you purchased any retail items and seen an RFID tag on the price tag? Yes, most of you have, which is awesome. So I started a small collection at my desk of <laughs> different retail price tags with RFID tags on them. Um, it might be a little nerdy, but it's kind of cool too. So we'll move on to the Q&A. We're going to have Joe Gamillion from Impinge and Paul Brown from HANA inviting and, and Martha back as well. So welcome back, everybody. Hi, Suzanne. 
Um, I did want to start off the chat by asking, um, so I know we talked a little bit about a system, an RFID system. I would love to ask Joe kind of if he can talk a little bit more about a reader's role in an RFID system because it's, you know, that main big component and that most costly component. Yeah, hey, Suzanne. Yeah, absolutely. That You know, without the reader and the tag, we don't have a system at all, first off. But um, there's so many different, as you guys have been discussing, there's so many different types of, of readers that can be deployed, whether it's a handheld device, a sled that you can slide a cell phone into and use an app with. Um, there's overhead readers that can be mounted, uh, whether continuously or always on, to be able to always be doing reading um, of any kind of tags that move in and out of that environment. Um, and then and how you set those readers up really matters too. Uh, it's important to understand what the environment's like. You can maximize the performance of that reader. There's a lot of, uh, shall I say, settings and configurations that you can use inside these different readers to really maximize the deployment of your RFID operation. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I kind of wanted to send the same question to Paul Brown. He um, knows kind of the most about tags on this call. So, Paul, could you talk us through kind of an RFID tags role in a system since you are the resident expert over here? Yeah. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah. And thanks, everyone, uh, for joining the seminar today. Yeah. Uh, at HANA, what, what we're doing is we're, we're actually uh, creating the inlay that uh, the reader that Joe just mentioned is actually communicating with. So we're, we're actually taking a, an integrated circuit IC and we're attaching that to a PET material, uh, uh, conductive layers of, of aluminum typically. And what that's doing is that design is critical to, uh, Suzanne, you mentioned earlier, how far the UHF tags read and between 10 and 30 feet. So the design of that inlay integrated with the IC chip is really what dictates how far that's gonna read. And depending on how far the customer needs it to read, you know, we would design the inlay accordingly uh, to do that, uh, as, as, as well as, um, um, I was going to say, the, uh, yeah, the distance is a critical thing, as well as what material it's on as well. If you're doing liquid versus a cardboard box, uh, we would uh, tweak the design of the inlay so that it would read properly, uh, depending on which material uh, it was on. So yeah, we have over 30 years of experience of RFID inlay manufacturing and design. Uh, so we've been in this business a long time and and uh, yeah, look forward to uh, work, hopefully working with a lot of you that are listening uh, today. Thanks, Suzanne. Yeah, yeah, and I think Martha has some questions for us so we can get started with our Q&A. I do, more things are coming in through the Q&A panel. So um, please use that actively and we'll get through your questions. Um, so uh, the question came through while we were speaking that um, it was about what kind of assets are most commonly tracked. So the question is how can RFID, RFID be used in GIS, government information systems? For example, a specific example asked fire hydrants. Ooh, okay. So who would like to answer that question? How about, um, how about, how about you, Paul? Yeah, I mean, a, a fire hydrant depends on what you're actually trying to, to track. Um, you could use a, an active tag, for example, that would uh, tell you, you know, keep act, access to that um, tag or that fire hydrant and let you know which one that was uh, for maintenance and uh, follow up, uh, those types of things. I don't know, Joe, if you want to add anything yeah, I, to I that. Would... I would just add, you could definitely uh, track that asset. And if you've got the right kind of setup in your reader system, you've got reader antennas located at the, maybe it's an entrance and exit to a facility. You want to make sure that that uh, hydrant stays in that facility. You could definitely do that. And if you've got the right IC uh, with enough memory on there, you could definitely be able to keep a, a running log, if you will, every time someone performs a maintenance on that fire hydrant, you want to make sure it's working accurately and, and it's been maintenance properly. You can keep a running history on that by uh, always scanning that tag, you know, uh, date time stamping, the day of the maintenance. There's a lot of different ways that you could tag these types of assets continuously throughout a, throughout a, a system. And of yeah. course, integrate them into your systems in the back end, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's I mean, that's the point that I was going to hit on there, Martha. I mean, like we would ultimately want to understand what problem you're trying to solve. I mean, like the short answer is we can absolutely tag those hydrants. We could tag them with a, a durable tag that's going to last the, the you know the lifetime of the, the hydrant. 
Uh, and, um, you know, but we would really want to understand, you know, like the, the, you know, what data you would need to see to be able to make business decisions. That's really where it becomes important as far as the uh, the technology actually working, the hardware working, that wouldn't be a problem at all. Problem at all. We've got we've we've helped customers with similar applications, but you know the starting point for us is um, you know what what business problem, what visibility, what decisions do you need to make with that data? Uh, you know that's where we would we would want to want to start. But you know to answer your question, it would absolutely be feas feasible for the technology to function. Um, it's just taking yeah. it to that next level as far as gaining the data that you need to be able to make those decisions. And I was going to say that it's kind of popular too for city works. Um, so like if you have a, you know, a top of a sewer or you have a fire hydrant or, or something like that, where maybe you're called out one day and you just want to keep a record of how many times you're called out to that, you know, how many times the fire hydrant has leaked or how many times y'all checked that sewer station, you know, you can scan the tag and input the data for that digital record and, you know, pull up records on, on a certain fire hydrant and be like, okay, we've had this many leaks. We've had to go out this many times to check it out. And just having that fire hydrant, having a unique guy, unique ID instead of, oh, they all look the same. They're all red, you know? <laughs> so that's, that's, what's awesome with it is keeping those records. Perfect. Perfect. All right, so here's a, a technical, a little bit of technical question that came in. Will this RFID antenna, or you were talking about Suzanne uh, about antennas at the time, will it interfere with Wi-Fi signals, and what frequencies are used? So, how does the RFID uh, interact, complement, or interfere with? I, I can, I can, I can take that one. If, if it's all right. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, it is, it is a different. Frequency. So, so Wi-Fi is operating at 2.4 gigahertz or more. UHF RFID is 860 to, to 960, right? So, because they operate on different wavelengths, we're, we're you know, there's not any head-on collisions that are happening. So, you know, in our environment here, and we have Wi-Fi in our office, we do a lot of testing in our office, and you know, the Wi-Fi signal is, you know, it's something to consider. I mean, you have a lot of factors that will affect how how effective the system is, but you know we, we're deploying RFID in environments where there's where there's Wi-Fi and other you know technologies like like Bluetooth um, that you know don't really have a tremendous impact. I mean, sure it's a consideration, but don't have a tremendous impact on how the UHF uh, RFID system some, operates because it's on different it's on different wavelengths, different different wavelengths on the spectrum. Fantastic. All right. Uh, oh, questions coming in quickly. Let's see if we can do one. Um, here's something uh, similar about uh, the fire hydrant discussion. How environmentally rugged can UHF tags be, especially in outdoor assets in the heat? So, Paul, I'm going to flip this one to you first because, from the uh, form factor perspective, yeah, you have the ability. You 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 can take a tag and uh, put it inside a plastic uh, casing, um, for example, to protect it from the elements. Uh, so you basically make a, a what we would term a hard tag instead of just a label that uh, then would disintegrate, uh, you know, with rain and and weather. Uh, so that's typically what would be done in in those types of uh, in environments. So it would survive um, cold temperatures, uh, heat, and uh, yeah, sunlight. Fantastic. I would add there too, um, Martha. You know, I've been around this industry for a long time now, and I've seen these types of tags stuck inside of liquid nitrogen. You know, freezers. I've mm -hmm. seen them stuck inside of tires. You know, at hot temperatures. Um, so I would ask the reverse question. You know, let me know what you want to tag that needs ruggedness. <laughs> And we'll go find you a solution. These days, yes. there's definitely people out there with That's some it. incredible capabilities that could solve a lot of problems when it comes Absolutely. to tagging. Absolutely. It's a great, great uh, reason to get started with small applications. So you could do that yeah. test, right? That's, that's a yep. good point, Joe. We actually make a, a, a tag that gets embedded into the sidewall of a tire. So yeah, yeah it, it passes. And then it lasts, uh, right? Paul, it's all those last rugged, long. yeah. We, we've, yep. We're in about 75 trillion miles of tires uh, without one <laughs> failure. So yeah, pretty yeah. amazing stuff. 
And yeah, then, and I mean, I've been in the in the industry for a, a decade, and you know, some of those first customers that I helped with rugged tags are still using those tags, and, and really, there's no there's no end in sight. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if manufacturers, tag manufacturers, continue to get more creative because as the challenges increase, like they're meeting those challenges and creating a product to fit those needs. Yeah. And the placement of the tag on the item could also, you know, help things depending on what's it, what it's going on, right? To, to yeah, help and protect a, and it as well. A perfect comment that came in through the the uh, Q and A panel uh, was from a, a person named Noreen Ferguson who says, for fire departments, uh, we use uh, the tools that the firemen firemen yeah. use: ladders, hoses, axes, axes, etc. So, of course, those come in all shapes and sizes, and of course, are used in um, very critical conditions. And also need to be stored properly for safety, et cetera. So form factor is important. Yeah, for sure. Can tag all those items and uh, easily track them for sure and their movements. Yeah. Great. Um, here's a question about, uh, do you have any recommendations to prevent vandalism of tags that are out in the field? You know, I I, I can, I'll take that one. I, I think that, you know, we get a question, we get questions quite often about tamper evident, right? Um, and there, there are certainly tags that are, you know, you can determine if they're, you know, if they've been fiddled with, if you will, like tried to have been cut off or, or, or what have you, but, you know, the, there, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a, you know, a few tags in particular that really have a, um, I mean, you can take a sledgehammer to them, right, and put an excessive amount of force on them. They they do have to be, you know, plastic or polymer of some some type because you know RFID won't read through like a, a metallic uh, or metal. Uh, so they do have to be plastic, but that plastic is very 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 durable. And you know, when I think about you know removal of tags, right, which is you know a possibility, it's you know we have to look at how they're being attached. You know, if it's just adhesive. You know, that's really challenging to, um, you know, prevent someone from moving. I mean, we can obviously put a really, really uh, strong adhesive on there, which makes it more challenging to remove. But, you know, if it's a hard asset, you know, what I would want to, you know, kind of steer you towards is using an attachment method like rivets or screws or an epoxy or maybe maybe like an epoxy plus screws or something along those lines that makes it really challenging uh, to remove. And then another aspect is, can we put that tag in a more inconspicuous location? Right. Because as Sue's mentioned, it's, it doesn't have to be line of sight. So if, if I mean, we can't read through metal, we can't through, read, through, read through liquid, but if we can put that tag in a more inconspicuous location, the reader doesn't necessarily have to have that line of sight to, to read that tag. And one of the best examples of that, I mean, it was it was it happened so long ago, but um, there was a company that embedded tags um, in walkie talkie radios, but they put it inside the knob. So it didn't look like there was a tag in there. You would have no idea that there was a tag in there unless you knew there was a tag in there. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's all about like you either have an inconspicuous location you either have a super rugged tag, or if it's neither, um, there are people that are putting obviously pull pa pull, uh, toll passes <laughs> that they have it on their windshield. And that's one of those things where if you try to take it off, uh, the tag just breaks. So you can't reuse it, you know? So it just kind of depends on the asset and like what your options are. Perfect. You know, there's a couple of questions that are real similar. Let's make sure we get those answered. They're they're similar, similar answers, but slightly different questions. And I think it's really good so for people to hear the examples. Um, so one uh, participant says, I came across something called a ceramic UHF RFID tag that was very compact. What is their application and how are they different from standard or on metal UHF tags? So ceramics, so any experience in ceramic tags? We saw some ceramic tags um, and they're they're great. We mostly sell them for, especially, I think I kind of know what type of tag you're talking about when they're really small. Um, we see a lot of them in tool tracking um, because you can also kind of embed them in there. Uh, they're good for embedding because they, they can just like fit very nicely into your tool, whether it's a scalpel and healthcare or a wrench or anything like that. Um, I usually say that they're great for embedding. Um, Steven, do you have any other insight on no, that? You're 
Yeah, you're spot on. I mean, like that's primarily a, a tag that's used for, you know, it's either like a small IT asset that you're trying to tag. I mean, like the mobile, like a mobile computer or device or something along those lines, or a more ruggedized item like a, um, like a tool. Um, you know, in fact, I mean, some of us may have played at Top Golf before. Embedded in their mm -hmm. tag is a ceramic tag. So, yes. I mean, it's just a ceramic material with the aluminum or you know whatever metal material used for the antenna wrapped around that ceramic piece with the chip attached so it serves the same say this the same functionality as what Suzanne described earlier in our our conversation it's just it is a more niche um, use case and um, you know they're typically on metal there are some that are specified for just plastic but in most cases ceramic tags are you know on metal tags um, so, but they function the same way. Uh, it's just, there's so many, there's so many tags and it's just important that that's what, what we do. I mean, we have a lot of different offerings on our site, uh, and our, and some that are not on our, our website. Uh, you know, our, our mission, our objective is to guide you to the right products for your application. So kind of going back to what I said earlier, like we want to understand what the business need is, what the problem is, what you're tagging, what what your you know what your objectives are, so we can give you guidance towards the right the right product to fit that application. That's a great question. Fantastic. Similar question. Um, have you had success when having a, a tag used in plastic injection molding? Uh, I think this goes along with your tire example, Paul, uh, uh, where the tag can withstand the heat of molten polycarbonate or ABS uh, and is ex acceptable for a brief period uh, while that yeah, it'd be it'd be similar to what to what we're doing for the uh, embeddable tire tag. Uh, I know people have done it into plastic pallets, for example, um, and and actually embedded them inside the plastic. So yeah, that's that's all all doable. It's just like um, uh, Stephen mentioned, uh, you have to design the tag appropriately for the environment it's going in. Um, but yeah, you pretty much put a tag anywhere and on anything <laughs> for sure. All right. Um, so here's a, a follow-up question to that. How about underground assets? Uh, I assume they wouldn't work because of dirt, si sidewalk, et cetera, that's blocking the signal. So what about uh, concrete, dirt, uh, things that are uh, a foot down? Joe, you want to answer that one? I mean, I definitely have seen concrete embedded tags that have that are definitely readable, if you will. Um, but yeah, there is some level of, um, you know, if you cover the, um, the ground, if you put a certain amount of dirt over the top of a tag, it, it, it could get to the point where it'll be difficult to read. Uh, but there's a lot of giveaway there. You know, how big is the tag? How much, um, you know, reader, how much strength or energy are you sending to the tag to try to get a read? Um, and then how much of, a, of a, a barrier do you have between the tag and the reader itself? So, yeah, there's definitely some room to work in there to make it, to make it work. Uh, um, but, yeah, you could, I could bury it deep enough. To make it so you couldn't read a UHF tag. <laughs> it just depends on what you're trying to do with the use case. Deck, let me do a quick follow up to that too, because I think it's a, a similar answer. So, on these rugged uh, tags, are they reactive? They don't need batteries, correct? You can permanently install and forget. Right. Passive tag. Everything's passive. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. passive. If it's passive, you don't have to replace it every three to five years with that battery. Sure. But we do talk about talk to people and they're like, oh, we want to read it from hundreds of feet, 200 feet. And I'm like, OK, well, that that requires a little bit more of an investment, you know, like, are you sure that's what you actually want? But no, passive tags don't need a battery at all. It's work. And Martha, I saw the question about the, the museum and tagging art. Yeah, that was my next to, one. <laughs> I wanted to add that you know, we're talking about some really durable hard tag solution sets that are out in the market. There are some too that take into account, um, you know, the, the need to be really careful with certain materials. So there's some adhesives out there that are made specifically for that type of use case. Uh, there's materials made for that. They can embed RFID into it. You absolutely could tag a very expensive piece of art if you wanted to. Um, it's, it's done in some galleries already. Um, I've worked with a couple of small uh, providers out in the market that have done that. So, yeah, don't just think everything's hard and, and has to be super durable. Mm -hmm. There are some, there are so many technologies built around embedding RF into these types of really specialty use cases. Yeah. And, and document control as well, right? You can document, yeah, yeah. We can track, uh, put it on paper and track documents as well. Frankly, for everyone who's listening, it's the best part of my job. Like every time <laughs> I turn around, I never know what we're gonna 
to be tagging. And it's it's just a phenomenal, uh, yep. you know, I've had just the best career enjoying tagging some of the most incredible things. Like said, there's not much we couldn't dream up that we can tag as an industry. I agree with that. There are a lot of use cases too that, you know, you don't want to hurt the document. So there are a lot of city people that are um, tagging like city plans or maps or very expensive documents that they have and they can't have a tag, you know, rip off of them. So that's definitely doable. And that's honestly, it, it it's it's less unique than some of these rugged and bevel tags that we've been talking about, but the rugged right. tags are kind of cool too. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. All kinds of shapes and sizes. So a couple of uh, practical implementation questions too. So uh, RFID products, those that are described in this webinar, are they being an, applied in South America, spe specifically Chile? Chile. And you might have some answers for that. Yeah, I mean, we do have customers in Chile. Um, the thing that, like, the most important thing that we'll want to look at there is whatever devices, um, you know, you 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 know, are fit for the application are also certified for use in that region or country. Uh, which is something that that our team can provide guidance on, but absolutely yes, and it's actually, I mean, it, emerging a great deal in in South America. So you know, the answer to the question is yes, but we we'll, we would just want to make sure we're following all the all the guidelines uh, for your your country or region as it relates to uh, frequency emission. Yeah, I, I would add rain RFID UHF RFID. It's a global technology right. deployed all over the world. Absolutely, we have multiple. Uh, readers that work in all just about every region you can find around the globe. So absolutely global. It's accepted by almost all governments. Absolutely. Yeah, we could tag in Chile. Cattle, too, if you wanted to tag some cattle in Chile. <laughs> <for example. laughs> there, you go, there you go. All right. So uh, how much does a rain uh, average rain RFID system or average RFID system run? Of course, you know, it depends. So we'll let uh, uh, Suzanne and Stephen answer that. But also, um, how is it? How easy is it to join the info that comes from an RF tag into a GIS, a government information system? So, Stephen, yeah, thanks for that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is that is a a, a loaded question right there. And, and <laughs> you know, Martha, as you as you mentioned, it does it does strongly depend, and and you know depends on the the application requirements. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll tell customers once once we understand you know, the, the scope of the actual physical application. And what I mean by that is like the hardware needed to support it. You know, we're talking the readers, the tags, like we can provide you with an estimate on the hardware, right? Like these are the, these are the readers that you're going to need to cover this area or that area, or, you know, you're going to need 11 handheld readers to support, you know, 10 associates, whatever it might be. Like we can give you an idea of, of the hardware. Now, one of the variables is software, right? Because the scope of software is so abundantly different from one organization and one company to the next, that requires, you know, some time for our team to, to really analyze what that looks like, put a scope of work together and present that to you. Um, I can tell you that, you know, I've seen RFID applications as low as, you know, probably in the $3,500 range, uh, $3,500, then it's a full system, right? It's a small, compact system up to you know, as much as you'd like to spend, right? As much as you have to spend. And I mean, it really does vary a great deal. But, you know, what I would just encourage is, you know, getting in contact with someone on our team to, you know, we'll start with the problem, with the problem, like I mentioned earlier, uh, get a really good idea of, of, of what you've got going on, be able to provide you an estimate on the hardware. And then, you know, another key component is we never recommend like, buy all of this. We always recommend, hey, let's start small. Crawl, walk, run approach is the best approach for UHF RAIN RFID. And it is more prevalent and it's it's more effective than it even was 10 years ago, but it's really important to test, you know, confirm that it functions like it needs to function. And then scaling the application becomes easily easy as long as you do that step you know, test and test effectively and then scale from there. So I know that's not, that's like an, an answer, but not an answer. Um, but um, yeah, I hope that, I hope that makes sense. I think that also it just really depends on how many places that you want to read. So if you just want one handheld reader and read five tags, you're going to be able to do that under like two grand without the software costs, which you'd have to kind of figure out. But 
do you want to have a fixed reader in every single doorway of your of your area like yeah that's going to cost a little bit more but then again you got to think those are the startup costs or the setup costs and the recurring costs with um uhf rfid rain rfid i mean that could be you know five to ten cents per tag so it's a lower recurring cost um steven do you know anything more about the gis system like getting the data into a gis yeah i mean we can you know we can like without any additional software you know, package or cost or anything along those lines. Like we can, we can help customers export RFID tag data to where to a to a destination where they would then be able to ingest or digest that data. What you know, and and as far as that process, I mean, it could be any any sort of method. I mean, it could be as simple as like a keyboard wedge or keyboard emulator. I mean, that's the most simplistic method. But you know, if you have multiple fixed readers on, you know, that you need to deploy, you need to put them on a network. We can export data in a JSON, in like a JSON format. So it's got you know these these key values that you can you can parse and and put in the correct position within your your system or program. But one thing that is really critical is this application called a middleware program that sort of acts like a traffic cop between your GIS and the RFID system that's, that's putting the data in the right place, making those associations, and then giving you those dashboards like Sue's mentioned, right, so you can make those business decisions. Um, so, you know, we can, we can certainly export data and push it to a destination, but one of the critical aspects is that middleware program that's going to for lack of better terms, just tie everything together. Fantastic. Um, here's a, a interesting one from a, a tag capabilities standpoint or an IC capability standpoint. So if someone has someone else has an RF reader, can they read your tags? Is there what kind of security can you give to a tag? So Joe, why don't you answer that one? Yeah, the, the short answer is yes, but really what, what are they getting from doing that? Um, it, most all tags are a license plate to a specific item. Um, but if you don't have any context around what the license plate is, like if I show you 50 license plates, you're not going to know which one of them goes on my car. And so being able to, in, in most all these tags are lockable in almost every application, you lock the tag once you put the data into the tag. So it's, uh, you know, it's super important to make sure you're protecting the data from that perspective. Uh, but yeah, you know, you don't want to, you know, you could, I could walk up and read tags in Walmart, uh, but, you know, I don't know what that data means it, unless I've got access to their system, their software in the background and, and, and can understand exactly what the, uh, the license plate means. Um, I don't know, Shane, or, uh, Steve, you want, you want anything to that? Go ahead, Susan. Well, say that uh, the license plate thing is my favorite. I was going to add in, I love saying that because you drive around every single day with your license plate visible to everyone and everyone can write that down. But unless they have access to the DMV, like, <laughs> they don't have your address. They don't have your name. They don't know what that means. They just see like one C5874, right? right? So it's just right. such a good example because that's just all they're going to see. Like, I, like you said, I have all these tags on my desk from Target, from Walmart and all that kind of stuff. And I can read them, but I don't know what any of it means. So if, yeah. I just wanted to add that in. Yeah, yeah nice, I mean, thank you. yeah, the last, like, the, like, that's exact. I mean, like you are with RFID, you're giving a digital identity and then you have to associate that identity with data that's really meaningful to you. Once you make that association, the RFID, the data on the tag almost becomes irrelevant because you're interfacing with what, like the data that matters to you, you know, yeah. once that once that's tied together because of that, you know, the license plate analogy. Fantastic. All right, let's see if there's some other things. All right, a couple of people are helping to ask. Someone says, I have a million questions. Uh, is there <laughs> someone I can follow up with? Um, Suzanne, why don't you walk through some of the resources that you put into the resource folder? Yeah, so I put a couple of resources. Um, I always love a good after a webinar, like, hey, what all did we talk about? Because it goes by kind of fast and a lot of people throw a lot of information at you. <laughs> so I put a little thing in there that it says just a, a one sheet piece of collateral that just talks about what we talked about. Um, and it talks about the equipment that was used. It talked about how you can get in touch with us and it talks about more resources. So one of my main jobs is creating information about RFID because when I first joined Atlas 12 years ago, the only thing you could find about RFID was written by um, 
like electrical engineers or RF engineers. And they were like, Kate's, there were these, I couldn't read them. I didn't know what they meant, you know? So what my job is, is basically to make RFID easy to understand. Um, and so our, at atlasrvstore.com, we have a learn part, um, a learn main menu tab at the top. And it has, we have a blog on there about all articles about how people are using it. We have resources like eBooks. I think I've, we have over like 30 something eBooks now. Um, don't let that scare you. It's just, you know, we have a lot of information um, and it's easy to digest. And we also have um, a book book, a hardcover book, and then a digital version as well. And those resources are all linked in that PDF. So I have two PDFs on there. One of them is going over those item tracking technologies just so you can kind of wrap your mind around item tracking. And then the other one is kind of our webinar takeaways. Um, so if you go there, like go down the rabbit hole and look at all of the fun, you know, things that people are using RFID for. And as Stephen kind of mentioned Top Golf, and it's like the best kept non-secret, but secret. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like all these big companies, they're really using it. So go there, learn about, about how it's being used, learn about how it's actually like how to implement it and how to do it. Um, and they, we use the technology from Martha and Joe and Paul to, to get us where we are today. So go to atlasrvstore.com or check out these resources that are in the collateral folder. Yeah. And Martha, just to follow up on that, um, you know, like Steven said earlier, really uh, setting up a quick call and, and having a conversation and trying to understand uh, what your situation is, what your issue is that you're trying to solve. Uh, and there may already be a solution or there may not be. And 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 finding that out and and getting a good understanding of that will allow us to to figure out which direction to to, to point you and and to solve your problem. Paul's exactly right. If you're a caller and you want to call and ask and talk about it, we've got people to talk to you all day about it. <laughs> They're really excited. Just like Joe said, it's fun. There are fun things yeah. to talk about. We actually really enjoy it. So if you want to give us a call, like Stephen, one of our sales guys, can just kind of talk you through what's available and uh, listen to what problems you have. I've answered a million questions and I'll answer a million more. Bring them on. Two more questions that came through the panel. And as long as people are willing to, to stay on, let's answer these questions because they're, they're yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Let's do it. So, um, back to, um, and I apologize, I had said uh, GIS is government information systems, but it's geographic information system. This one directly applies to that. So how does location information that uh, and it's uh, original information. Uh, does it? Do you encode it in the tag or do you encode it in the reader? So I think we've answered the second second part of that, which is you know the 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 code means something and it can be attached to the database. But let's talk about uh, data on the tag. So we have multiple. Go I'll, ahead, I'll jump in for a second, and then you guys can pick up behind me. So we have multiple different types of tag ICs with different types of volume, uh, uh, sorry, not volume, with different types of uh, memory capabilities. And so the answer is, yeah, you're definitely gonna be encoding data from the reader to the tag and it lives on the tag. Um, and a lot of times that, that data gets just locked as a license plate. Um, but if you do have a larger memory IC, again, you can go back and rewrite. If you know how to unlock the tag, you can rewrite the tag multiple times, hundreds, thousands of times if you want adding additional information in there until you use up whatever memory is uh, available on the IC. Um, a lot of times, you know, you may only keep a certain time frame of data on there. Maybe it's the past year, how many times you've accessed, you know, that particular item and, uh, and done some type of time and date stamp or whatever data that you're adding to the IC. So you definitely are clicking the tag and you can do that multiple times uh, yeah, from the I'll reader. I'll expand on that a little bit. I mentioned the RFID uh, tire tag that, that we develop. One of the things that goes in is truck tires, and they use that tag to track the retread process. So every time it's retreaded, they're they're tracking and writing that information to the chip mm -hmm. so that they have yeah, that information um, available and they know exactly when they read it. They know how many times it, it's gone through the retread process and whether it can be retreaded again or not. Beautiful. Reading and writing. Okay, this last one may stump somebody. So uh, <laughs> probably not. Yeah. So what about a tag that can be placed on a seal of a bottle or some other thing, such as a bottle of alcohol, where it responds to the antenna and that when the seal is broken, um, it, the reading stops? 
That's, I was going to say, this goes back to Suzanne's uh, comment about the uh, the windshield tag, right? It's a tag yeah. that if you try to remove it, uh, it damages the tag so it can't be read. So it'd be similar yeah. to that. Yeah, and I think, Stephen, you've seen um, some use cases, too. Um, I think the only problem with there would not be the tamper evident part. It would be the size of the bottle cap that you would have to put the tag on. So I feel like that would be some sort of you'd have to embed the tag in the bottle cap um, and then have some sort of yeah, it would be unique, but I don't think well, you could do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like it would it would I could, it, you know, it would be in, an inlay design. I mean, like, a, you know, an RFID inlay is is a circuit and we would just need to break that circuit, you know, yep. and, yeah, um, yeah. you know, it would, it would stop functioning. So, you know, the short answer is, yeah, that is, is possible. And, you know, Paul's a great example. And we have a lot of customers that are using, you know, like, I mean, you wouldn't want uh, someone else to, to pull off the access control to, you know, tag to your HOA and put it on their vehicle and access your gated community. Right. So for so, that reason, when you remove the tag, it stops functioning. So, so the short answer is, yeah, it's possible. And I think that there are some other, like maybe airlines doing it. I feel like I have read some articles about um, if you tamper with something in an airline, especially like equipment, like like that's consumer facing. So maybe like a seat or something like that. They have tamper evident tags where they can actually be, you know, when they take the next scan, they can see, okay, well, before this flight, I read 60. After this flight, I read 50. So it means that there are 10 that have you know, lost track of that we have have been tampered with. So tamper evident is actually it's pretty it's becoming way more common um, yeah. that people are trying to do. So that part is definitely doable. Great. Yep. Well, fantastic. So we're um, so we're at the end of our webinar. And um, so first of all, I want to thank the panelists and the presenters for the time today, and everyone who was able to join us and hang on for a little bit extra time. Um, the recording will be made, will be available shortly after this, so you can go back into the Connect Me uh, registration landing page. Since you are registered, you'll be able to see those archived recordings, including our first session. And of course, don't forget those resources that are available to you in the resource folder. And I hope you'll join us for our next uh, session. So some of these questions that were leading up to the end are uh, perfect for you to join the next one because we'll dive in a little bit deeper about how you can create and implement your tagging strategy um, with HANA Technologies. This session will be on July 11th. Uh, it's noon Eastern, 10 a.m. Mountain or 9 a.m. on the Pacific time zone. And uh, uh, again, thank you everyone. And that ends today's session. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thank Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody.